with you. This is great. It's good to be with you. I have heard your name, obviously, throughout the endo community. And from everything I've, I've read and heard, you are very well respected for what you have done for the one in 10. So thank you from the bottom thank of you. our hearts. Thank you. And I'm just taking on the collective here. <laughs> no, thank you so much. Uh, it's been you know, quite the journey since I decided to share the my, my story with Endo and then went to work in the US house to go do something about it. Um, I'm just, you know, I, I, I wish I would have even started sooner in the first year, but it was one of those things where sometimes the timing, even though it seemed weird too, because it was right before the pandemic, it didn't seem like the best time um, to be uplifting new issues. But at the same time, I also thought, if I don't do this now, when will I share this? And when, you know, it, it was just, it, it was necessary and I'm, I'm glad I did it. And there's just, it's been quite the journey getting to meet and talk to folks all over the country who are connected to this issue and have already been doing so much great work within this space already. So that's been fun as well. We have some very exciting news to share as well because you are now officially an EndoFound ambassador. So welcome to the team. Thank you so much. No, it it means a lot. You know, the the Endometriosis Foundation of America has been um, great to get to work with. And actually, the story. And I don't know if people all know this, but part of how I realized that I was one in ten, and that how prevalent endometriosis was, even though I'd been living with it knowingly since I was about eighteen or nineteen, I still didn't know much about it. I didn't know how many people had it. I didn't know any of this. And it was when I was sitting on my bed on, I think it was like February of 2020, unable to fly home that weekend because I was, well, actually there was a lot of delays. So it was gonna be difficult to get home anyway for a short weekend. But I thought, oh my gosh, I can't sit in the Charlotte airport for eight hours because I'm in so much pain right now. And I was doubled over and I just started Googling hysterectomies because I was just like, I don't know. I don't even, I didn't know what care was out there. I didn't know anything. I just was like, how do I make this stop? And that to me was what I did. And then when I did that was actually when I came across Endometriosis Foundation of America and found all of the stats and also realized, oh my gosh, we, uh, we as in Congress, and uh, which was me, uh, have, you know, underfunded this, um, this condition for, I mean, it's at the bottom of the National Institute of Health funding, um, well, for mm -hmm. forever since it's been funded at all. And so I was just like, well, okay, someone needs to do something about that. And I guess I'm in the position to do it. So that's actually how it happened, finding EndoFound. Wow. Um when you discovered how underfunded the disease was and you thought, okay, I'm in a position to do something. What was the process of coming forward with your story? Because it is so personal and it is a topic that as much as it should not be taboo, anytime you talk about menstrual hygiene, health, there's a, a little bit, of, I wouldn't, I would want to see the word embarrassment, but we're still, we're in 2021 and I feel like a hush hush kind of thing. Yeah. And you're going into a, I mean, the tides are evening a bit, but it's a male dominated community in which you're in that you work in. Were you thinking, okay, I'm going to go in this public forum and tell everyone about m my health, my body. How well, it was interesting. Yeah. So it was really interesting because I have been in public service, right? So it wasn't like I had just, my first time ever in public service was my you know term in congress i'd been in the state house for four years before that and i've talked about women's issues before and women's health but i never ever shared my story with endo um and just it it was also one of those things where and i i hate to say it this way but it's true when you are young and you are a woman and you're up against sometimes a lot of different stereotypes that people like to put on you like you're inexperienced or you can't do the work or you can't all of those things that people like to say I remember thinking to myself I can't give them one other thing to think that I can't do this and I think that was part of why I never shared the story when I was in the state house um, because I just thought okay I it, you know it was, it was too personal it was too close and then when I was in congress 
I just got to the point again, when I saw that number of <laughs> how low that funding was in the teens and how it ranked compared to all of these other conditions and diseases and all of the things. And this is, you know, and all of the things that men have and that how much money those get. Mm -hmm. And here it was, this thing of one in 10 women have, and it's just at the bottom. And I just thought to myself, well, now it's not really about me anymore. And I'm now in this really strong position to highlight this issue and to go fight for it. And it was just what I had to do. I, there really wasn't any option, I think, after I saw that number. I, I just knew there, and I also realized there was no caucus. There's a caucus in Congress for literally everything. I mean, um, there's a, you know, a big cat caucus. There's a um, caucus for, I mean, again, literally everything. And there just wasn't one for endometriosis. And I thought, well, I'm in this position, let's just do it. And I'm not gonna just keep waiting for someone else to. So why don't I? And it was scary to think like, I'm gonna talk about this. I'm gonna, you know, discuss with my constituents my ovaries, right? Like that's, I, 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 you know, worked on a lot of issues with roads and bridges and infrastructure funding and trade and all of that. And I'm sure, you know, my district <laughs> would probably have preferred me to just keep talking about all that. But at the same time, what I realized after I shared my story is how many women and, you know, and men in this district too, who have who, whether their wives have endo or whether their sister or whatever it is that they've seen, um, they were just so grateful that someone finally spoke up about it. And that to me was everything. And it just, it was worth taking that risk. Was there any surprise from people? Like I never even heard about endo before. I didn't know what it was or I heard of it, but I didn't know how extreme it was or the severity or the impact it could have on someone's life. Yeah. And those were things I didn't know. Right. So I knew I had endometriosis. I, I had two surgeries for it. I, I knew I had it. Um, I have, I didn't know that there were different stages. I knew nothing. I just knew, okay, this is something I have and it causes me pain um, at times. And I didn't know what stage I didn't know. I didn't know anything. And so that was really interesting, even for me to start learning about because it was just not something I was ever educated about even though I have it. And so that was just a whole nother thing where, I mean, I'd have constituents or folks on, you know, Facebook or Twitter or any of the social media platforms when I started sharing my story, whether it was reacting to the articles they saw about it or whatever it was saying, oh my goodness, that's what it felt like for me. Or, you know, some, some women, you know, in their, in their sixties sharing their story, possibly publicly for the first time in even just a Facebook chat, right? It was just this really empowering moment where I think people saw somebody in the public space, like I was in, in the, you know, the government space saying these things and talking about it. And all of a sudden they went, okay, I can share it too. And and we're not alone here. And there was just such a groundswell of the stories I heard, all of that. And it also made me realize, again, I'm one of the lucky ones. I just am. Um, I have it. I've been, you know, able to, um, I think it's, it's, you know, not at an advanced stage. I've been able to manage it decently well, but it's still like, you know, it, it's hard on some days, right? But they're the stories I have heard. These women are warriors. Oh my goodness. This is the, the things that folks have gone through and hearing their stories and um, just how this has, it, it can take people completely out, out in their twenties when it's their, you know, their time when they should be able to, to rise in their career or do all these things. And they're just taken out of it because this condition has taken over and there isn't great options yet. And that's what we're fighting for. And now with your role with EndoFound, what's your hope? What do you want to see improve, particularly with the endometriosis community in terms of uh, research, um, funding? Where, where do you really want to see the growth? Yeah. So I think obviously funding is going to be number one. I think that, continue need, that, that needs to continue to rise. It needs to at least stay um, at the, where we doubled it to the, the 26 million that that's needs to be the baseline 
it can't go lower than that ever again. Um, and I think there's some real opportunity to continue to grow that because of, again, the amount of, um, you know, the 10% of women who have this and, um, well, people with ovaries who have <laughs> this. Um, and so it's just, it's, it's huge. And I think there's such an opportunity there to get that right. And, and I, you know, I'm no longer in Congress, but, um, I do, you know, I, I hope that we see an increase there. I hope that folks are paying attention yet. And I also, you know, I, I hope people are paying attention to the equitability part of this too. I mean, what insurance covers and what it doesn't and how that affects what treatment people are able to get of the treatments that are out there, right? Mm -hmm. And I just think that's a huge piece of it. The education piece is huge, both for doctors, but also for the general public. I mean, it's again, astounding to me that I didn't know all of, you know, again, the different stages of endo. I didn't know any of that and I have it. And so the fact that we're not talking about that the way we need to be, I know um, obviously Endometriosis Foundation America did some great work um, in New York and got, um, you know, education as part of a curriculum and, and, and just really making that a big piece of it. I'd love to see that implemented in other states throughout the country and reaching those young, those young people before um, they're disheartened, before they get told by eight doctors that um, it's in their heads before you know they get down a path where they're just hopeless because there isn't the education both either on their end of not even knowing that it exists or their doctor's end by not diagnosing it correctly or treating it correctly right and then and then as they're going in circles getting misdiagnosed or not diagnosed at all their disease is advancing and yeah. that becomes much more complicated and obviously all the other um extra pelvic issues that that can happen with endo so yeah those are all crucial crucial things because part of it goes back to when you think about breast cancer obviously very very different diseases yeah. but when you think about the awareness a lot of people didn't know a lot about it yeah. 20 some odd years ago and then all this all these awareness campaigns happen it was synonymous with the the pink ribbon and people started paying attention and they got a lot of funding that's the hope for endometriosis that yeah. people understand this isn't just a bad period, whatever that elusive term means. This isn't just bad cramps. This is life altering, life sucking, debilitating disease that needs to be treated as so. And I think because it's called benign, it's anything but that for the person that has it. Yeah. But because it's been labeled benign, it's just not getting that attention and to go back to the funding and the research and the awareness. So it's because of people like you using your platform and, and your position that things will change. Well, and it is, you know, I think about this and it's women's pain historically just hasn't been believed, right? I mean, that's not even just hyperbole, that's facts of history. They've called it many different things, right? Hysteria, <laughs> all of the stuff, right? That's where hysterectomy gets its word, basically, or gets its name. I mean, this is what, it's, it's just what it's been like. And I mean, we've known about endometriosis, I believe since the 1920s, it's mm -hmm. been named, but yet even all this time, there still is just this mystique around it. And it's, I, I do believe we're had a turning point here. I, I think we have a lot of work to do to just continue to uplift the issue, to educate all the things um, and, and really, believe women. I mean, that's the thing, right? It's, I went to multiple doctors before anyone ever diagnosed me. And I think back to it and, you know, Mother's Day was um, yesterday. So when we're recording this, it's, yeah, it was yesterday. And I, I, I'm grateful for my mother for many reasons. One of the biggest ones is that she believed me and she didn't give up on me. And I was in so much pain. I, I mean, in, in you know, high school and college years, I mean, college was tough. My first few years of college when I didn't know why I felt the way I did, why it just, and you go to doctor after doctor and they just try to, you know, give pain medicine and say, this is enough. And it just wasn't for me. It, it, was, it was like, I, there's something else here. Like, it's not just, I'm not making this up. And um, the fact that she never gave up on me and the fact that she believed my pain because for her, 
she knew whatever I was feeling wasn't normal because she didn't feel that way. My sister never felt that way. So she was like, something is up here and she just didn't give up. And that I'm very grateful for, but not every person has an advocate like that or, or even has an opportunity to be. There are moms out there who, who know that's what they're, they just don't know, right? They don't know that, I, my mom didn't know what endometriosis was. She had no idea, but she just knew something was wrong. And I just, we have got to make sure that it's not just lucking in to having the right advocates that we can level the playing field here and make sure that women can get the help that they need, especially at a young age. Yes, yes. And doctors can recognize the disease. Yes. So it's not, the onus is not on the patient, so to speak, who's already in such a vulnerable state looking for answers or their caretakers, like a parent who's supposed yeah. to just guess what it is and tell a doctor. Yeah. Um, I'm very excited to be on this journey with you. I think, to use the word turning point, we are definitely at a crux in the road where I think progress is ahead. And this is the time to change the history for the person with endometriosis. So uh, I am thrilled. Um, thank you for joining us today on Endo TV as well. Well, thank you so much. And thanks to everybody out there watching and who care about this issue. And thanks for talking about this issue um, as, as much as you possibly can and educating all your friends. <laughs> See you soon, Abby. Bye.